we'll share my screen again. Good. So, um, yeah, um, I hope you can see this. Please let me know in case you in case you don't. Um, so, as I we said, see, the, we oh, see. perfect. So, as I said, the um, the next chapter will be on auto tuning. That means the the automatic tuning of uh, of this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm that I presented before, but uh, but also of uh, of Monte Carlo algorithms in general. It is all about, as I said before, as well. Uh, but drawing independent models in a Monte Carlo simulation. And, uh, and that really is, is the challenge. Why is it important to draw models or samples that are independent? Uh, first of all, it is important for efficient model or null space exploration because independence means that, uh, that you're drawing models that are actually different from each other. So if you have an, a Monte Carlo algorithms, algorithm that draws models that are dependent or more dependent, then it means that the models that you're drawing successively actually more or less always look the same. And that of course is not, not what you want. But it is also important for the convergence of any Monte Carlo integral. So if you want to, to solve a Monte Carlo integral, then you can show that the convergence error of that Monte Carlo integral that you need, for instance, to to compute the mean or a standard deviation or a low dimensional uh, marginal, then that convergence error is proportional to one divided by the square root of the independent models. So what matters is not how many samples you draw, but what is important is how many of those are actually statistically independent. Let's look at an example. Um, we try to sample a Gaussian. A Gaussian is, uh, is not a very interesting function, but actually when you look at a 1000 dimensional Gaussian, then it starts to become interesting again. We equip this Gaussian with a covariance matrix that is diagonal and it's also in principle boring, but, uh, but the diagonal entries, they vary by about one order of magnitude from 0.1 to 1.1. And initially we say that the mass matrix of our null space shuttle, so this variable M, is equal to the identity matrix. This is the most simple thing we can do. And then the question is, how many of the samples that we actually draw in this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm are actually independent from each other? Now let's, uh, let's, let's see how we can do this. So we, we draw many, many samples. Uh, say we draw about 2000 and we measure the dependence or the independence of those samples using the autocorrelation of the sample chain. So what we do is we, we take one model parameter, say M1. So it's the first model parameters in our 1000 dimensional model space. And we compute the autocorrelation of this sequence of samples that we are drawing. And this autocorrelation normalized, the, the normalized autocorrelation is, uh, is shown here. Right? And, uh, and it is visualized in this plot in black. So you see that uh, the, uh, this autocorrelation function is always relatively close to one. So for this model parameter M1, we can draw many, many samples but even after drawing a thousand samples here, or after drawing 2000 samples, the autocorrelation is always relatively high. So this means that we draw many, many samples, but in the direction of M1, so for that one model parameter, they're actually always more or less the same. So you learn nothing new, even though you draw many, many samples. Now for model parameter M1000, so the last one, this looks very different. This autocorrelation function, which is plotted here, it rapidly drops from one to nearly zero, and then it stays near zero until the end of the simulation. So this means that for M1000, for that one model parameter, you very quickly draw samples that are independent, meaning that you actually see different aspects of model space, which is what you want. Um, 
we can quantify this a little bit more by computing the effective number of independent samples. There's a definition uh, or, or an equation for this. I, I want you to write this. The effective number of samples that you're drawing is equal to the total number of samples that you actually draw divided by one plus two times the autocorrelation function. And the autocorrelation function is what you see in the plot. And then from this, we can compute an effective sample fraction. So we take the, the effective number of samples and divide by the total number of samples. And what you see is that for model parameter M1000, this effective sample fraction is about 0.3, which means that in order to get a sample that is independent from the samples that you have already seen, you need to draw about three samples. But for model parameter M1, which has this uh, wiggly autocorrelation function in blank, this effective sample size, this effective sample fraction is only about 0.047. So this means before you see a model that is different from the ones that you have seen before, you have to draw about 200 samples. So very many, you have to draw many samples before you actually discover a new aspect of model space. And this of course makes this algorithm very inefficient. We can understand this in, in pictures. So what you see here, let's, let's look at the, at the red curve, is a projection of a Hamiltonian trajectory, so of, a tra of a trajectory of that null space shuttle, if you will, onto the M1, M1000 plane. So it's a two-dimensional projection of that 1,000-dimensional misfit surface. And, uh, and what you see is that if we choose the mass matrix M to be the unit matrix, our null space shuttle oscillates through this model space along the red curve. And what happens is that in M1000 direction, the space shuttle makes very rapid progress. So you very rapidly see something else. You very rapidly see a different corner of model space. But in M1 direction, so in this direction, the progress is very slow. So this means you, you progress, uh, progress along your trajectory, along this Hamiltonian trajectory. But in M1 direction, you're actually not covering a lot of distance. Now this changes significantly when you change the mass matrix. So if you say that the mass matrix is equal to the inverse covariance matrix of that Gaussian, then you find a trajectory that is shown here in blue. And the blue trajectory indeed makes equally rapid progress in all directions. So it equally rapidly progresses in M1 direction and in M1000 direction. So, so one can in fact show that the ideal mass matrix for such a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm is the, uh, is the Hessian of the potential energy, which is equal to the inverse posterior covariance matrix for the special case of a Gaussian. So this is all nice and good, but of course the problem is that the Hessian of the misfit functional cannot be computed or stored explicitly. It is simply too expensive to compute and too large to store on any computer for all the relevant problems that we are interested in. And this brings us to a trick, to a strategy to circumvent this problem. And it is based on, on quasi-Newton methods. So, so here's how this goes. The basic idea is to, to not pre-compute this Hessian, which I said is, is totally out of scale but to approximate the Hessian of the potential energy or of the misfit on the fly, that is, as the sampler is running. So what we do is we just use the last couple of samples to approximate the Hessian times an arbitrary vector, which is all we need for the algorithm. And this is very closely related to the well-known LBFGS method from nonlinear optimization. This is a quasi-Newton method, a classical one. And then we use the approximate Hessian as a mass matrix for the computation of Hamiltonian trajectories. So here's the concept in pictures. We start at some model M0, 
And this gives us an approximation of the Hessian, which we call H naught. And it is simply the identity matrix. And we say that this is the mass matrix. And then we progress. We have the next sample, M1. And then we use a first approximation of the Hessian, which we call H1. And this is based on M0 and M1. And then we progress and we get better and better approximations of this Hessian using more and more models. Right? But after some time, we throw away the last model. Right? So, so we throw away M0, which was here. And we use a Hessian approximation based on M1, M2, M3, M4. And then as we progress, we use an approximation based on M2, M3, M5, M4, M5, and so on and so forth. Right? And like this, we get successively better approximations of the Hessian, which we then use as the mass matrix for this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. So let's return to this, uh, to this 1000 dimensional Gaussian, again, with a, with a diagonal covariance matrix. And we have seen this autocorrelation plot before. So it's the autocorrelation plot of the sample chain for model parameters M1 in black, and M1000 in red. And just to remind you, we had effective sample fractions of 0.3, which is quite okay, meaning that you draw three samples and then you actually see a different part of model space. But for M1, this was very poor. We had to draw 200, about 200 samples before actually seeing something that was different from what we have seen before. And this is without this auto tune. And if we turn the auto-tuning on, that is, if we approximate the Hessian on the fly using the LBFGS method, then this autocorrelation plot changes dramatically. So now, not only M1000 decorrelates very quickly, but also M1. And so very rapidly, for both model parameters now, you start seeing different aspects of model space. And now our effective sample fractions are approximately equal. So 0.17 and, uh, and 0.14, meaning that you, you roughly draw five, six, seven samples, which is a very small number. And then you already see different corners of model space that you have not explored before. Well, here comes a somewhat more challenging example. This is the uh, a two-dimensional projection of the 1,000-dimensional Stiblinski tan function is an analytical function, which has four to the power of 500 local minima. So it's a, it's a very nasty one. And then if we do not use auto-tuning, we again have the problem that, uh, that one of the model parameters, M1000, decorrelates quickly. So you rapidly draw independent samples. But for the other model parameter, M1, the autocorrelation remains very high, meaning that you can draw as many samples as you like. They're still dependent. And then if you turn the auto-tuning on, again, as, as we wish, uh, both model parameters decorrelate quickly and, uh, and we have a much more efficient sample. So, so also here, uh, if the auto-tuning is turned off, so you have a highly correlated model parameter M1, you see that the sampler actually misses this local minimum that, uh, that the sampler with the auto-tuning accurately recovers. So it improves in many respects. Um, now this, this was a toy problem. I want to show you one that is, well, still a toy problem, but goes more in the, into the direction of an actual geophysical English problem. And it is uh, a one-dimensional viscoelastic full wave dimension, so one space dimension. The setup is as follows. We use a 1D viscoelastic wave equation. It's shown here in the frequency domain. So we have omega squared, which is frequency, times the displacement field, so the wave field, plus velocity squared. So this is the, the phase velocity of those waves. There's a complex quantity because we have attenuation in the system, times the second space derivative of the wave field. And that is equal to some external forcing F. There are two model parameters, physical model parameters that we're interested in. The first one is the real part of the logarithmic velocity that you see here. So we have 
the, the real part of the velocity divided by a reference velocity and we take the logarithm of this. So this is logarithmic velocity. And then we do the same for the imaginary part of velocity. So we and divide this by reference imaginary velocity and take the logarithm. And this is the logarithmic attenuation. Why do we use logarithmic velocity to attenuation? The reason is very simple. There are two reasons, main reasons. The first one is that probability densities that we're interested in actually do not change as we do the subjective flip from velocity to one over velocity, so to slowness. And, uh, and also if we use those logarithmic quantities, then it is actually legitimate to use a Gaussian as a prior probability density. If we were to use the attenuation or the velocity itself, then we would not be allowed to use a Gaussian because the Gaussian also admits negative values, but we know that both velocity and attenuation are actually positive physical quantities. Now, auto-tuning for this example is really essential because the uh, sensitivities with respect to the uh, logarithmic velocity and the logarithmic attenuation vary over many orders of magnitude. The, uh, this, the physical setup is as follows. We are in one space dimension. You're seeing uh, distance in kilometers on the y -ax on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we see here logarithmic velocity on top and logarithmic, uh, logarithmic attenuation, so the imaginary part uh, here below. The true model that we plug in is shown in black and some initial model is shown in red. The, the data in, in one dimension look as follows. Uh, what you see in the, in the top plot is a wave field at relatively low frequency at, uh, at 0.02 Hertz. Uh, the artificial observed wave field that we contaminated with noise is shown in black for a source that is located here at the position of the star. And the, the initial synthetic wave field is shown in red, that is noise free by design. Uh, and if we go to higher frequencies, then you see that the artificial observed and the initial synthetic wave fields, they really differ very, very significantly. There are cycle skips and so on and so forth. Just an impression to, of, those, uh, of those frequency domain wave fields that we're using. Then using this auto-tuning Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you can compute many statistical quantities, for example, one-dimensional marginal distributions for all of the model parameters. And, uh, and the number of those model parameters is 2,000, because there are 1,000 logarithmic velocities on the left and 1,000 logarithmic attenuations on the right. And, uh, and what's interesting here in particular is that, uh, is that when you look here in, in this region, for example, you very clearly see that, uh, that our velocity distribution, our posterior velocity distribution that we recover is bimodal. So you in fact have two families of plausible models based on those data. One is, uh, is, is, is up here and the other one, other one is down here. So you very nicely recover the non-uniqueness of, of this inverse problem, which results of course from the Nonlinear dependence of the observations of the model parameters, but also from the contamination with noise and the sparse data coverage. So important here also is that the effective sample sizes, when we do use the auto tuning, are above ten thousand for all of the model parameters for all of the two thousand model parameters. So ten thousand, the effective sample size. The total number of samples is one million, and if we had not used auto-tuning, then the effective sample size would be less than 100 for one, some of the model parameters, meaning that you definitely undersampled that posterior distribution. So also here some, some conclusions for this chapter. Um, in the motivation, I have shown you that the convergence of any Monte Carlo algorithm critically depends on the number of independent samples. So not on the total number of samples, and uh, in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the independence of the samples can be steered through the choice of the mass matrix. The ideal mass matrix is the Hessian of the misfit or of the potential energy. That is the second derivative of the misfit function. And, 
And I argued that this cannot be computed or stored explicitly. It would be too, com too computationally expensive to compute because there are too many second derivatives. And uh, for all of the interesting problems that we're typically dealing with, it also cannot be stored on a computer. So we have to find a different approximate solution. And uh, that approximate solution is to, to use an approximation of the Hessian, of the local Hessian, that comes from quasi-Newton methods that we know from nonlinear optimization. And then to use this approximate Hessian as the mass matrix in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. There are many quasi-Newton methods that one could use. The one that we have chose is uh, LBFTS. And, uh, and that, as you have seen in one of the illustrations, uses a small number of previous misfits and gradient evaluations in order to come up with a local Hessian approximation. And, uh, and in the numerical examples, in the, in the toy examples with the Gaussian and the Stablinsky, Stablinsky tank function, I have shown you that, uh, that quite often the effective sample size can increase by, by orders of magnitude. So this means in, in simple words that, the, that this auto-tuning strategy increases the, the efficiency, the convergence of this Monte Carlo sample, sampler by orders of magnitude. So that implies that with the auto-tuning, you can solve problems that otherwise you would just not be able to handle. And then I've shown you um, a still a simplistic application to a one-dimensional viscoelastic full waveform inversion. And there, my argument was that this auto-tuning is really absolutely essential in order to recover the posterior distributions of both velocity and attenuation. We have also seen that, uh, that using this auto-tuning Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you can quite nicely recover the multimodality of the solution. So you get uh, an impression of the, of the non-uniqueness of this inverse problem, that is of the existence of solutions that are very different from each other, but still explain the observations equally well. And, uh, and what is interesting from a geophysical perspective, uh, and I haven't shown this in, in, in that specific slide, is that, um, that even though we run a full waveform inversion and, and do things properly, I think there is uh, little hope to actually constrain attenuation in Europe. The, the information content is, is too weak. So this, this brings me to, to the last chapter, which, uh, which has nothing to do at all with, with Monte Carlo sampling, but with the solution of the forward and the adjoint problem this with the solution of forward and adjoint wave propagation through the earth. And it's a method that we, that we somewhat jokingly call, call smoothie SEM for reasons that you will uh, discover within the next couple of minutes. So it's really all about accelerating wave propagation and doing so through the use of wave field adapted meshes. So here comes the, the basic idea. To, to illustrate the idea, we, we look at first a uh, regular finite element mesh. This is what you see here to the right. We look at, uh, at a domain that is 600 by 600 kilometers. And we have a source, for example, an explosion or an earthquake that is sitting here and a receiver that is, that is over there. And in a regular finite element mesh or regular spectral element mesh, you would use a certain number of elements per minimum wavelength. You would do that regularly, for example, in this, in, in this case here. And this number of elements per minimum wavelength is needed to ensure that you have some reasonable numerical accuracy. Now in the figure to the right here, you can see a wave field snapshot for the mesh that you see to the left. In the background, in, in grayscale, you see the seismic velocities, so the p velocity and, and the s velocity. And in colors, you see the wave front of the s wave. This is this one. And the wave front of, of the p wave that travels through this relatively smooth medium. Now, interestingly, this, this wavelength that I mentioned up here, which controls the spacing, the grid spacing, or the, the size of the elements is actually 
an anisotropic quantity. Wavelength is anisotropic. And you see this quite easily. So parallel to the propagation direction. So here, the, the propagation direction of the wave is this. In this direction, the wave field varies pretty rapidly. But if you look in this direction, the wave field varies very slowly. So, so in this direction, in orthogonal direction, the wavelength is very large. But in this direction, a long wave propagation, the wavelength is very short. Right? So this wavelength here, there's no such thing as the one wavelength, but it is an anisotropic quantity that depends on the direction in which you're actually looking. And we can use this to our advantage. So instead of using the regular mesh that we see up here, we use a mesh that is adapted to this anisotrop to this anisotropy of the wave field. And uh, what you see, in fact, is that the grid spacing in propagation direction is much finer than the grid spacing orthogonal to the propagation direction, where, as we have seen above, the wavelength is a lot longer. So we then use the numerical mesh that, you, that we see in the bottom left, and we recompute our wave field. And this leads to the figure that you see here. And, and with the naked eye, you, you don't see a difference between the wave field on top for the regular mesh and the wave field below for this wave field adapted mesh. So the mesh is complexity adapted. And in this specific example, uh, the wave field adapted mesh that we see at the bottom uses about eight times less elements, which means that the computational cost for computing the wave field down here is about eight times less. So almost an order of magnitude less than for the wave field that you see on top. So this can be extended to three dimensions. That's what you see here. This is a, a toy example. Uh, to the left, there is a global scale wave field as one would use in traditional global scale spectral element simulations of, uh, of seismic wave propagation. Uh, this mesh here is good for wave propagation at a long period of about 100 seconds, and it has around 400,000 elements. The mesh that you see to the right is wave field adapted, so it is much coarser in azimuthal direction here. It produces wave fields that are almost indistinguishable from the wave fields for this uh, traditional mesh, but it has uh, less than less than 10% of the elements. And so, so here, actually, the computational expense for computing a wave field for, for this mesh are, is, is more than 10 times less than for the mesh that you see to the left. Uh, one can drive this a little bit further. One can even adapt those meshes to the coverage, to the data coverage that we have. This is what you see here. Uh, we have an event up here and stations in, in East Asia. And then, of course, one could, for example, cut out those pieces of the mesh where we are anyway not interested in the wave propagation. And then additionally, you can reduce the number of elements and reduce the computational cost. Now, so far, so good, but there's actually an, an additional difficulty or an apparent difficulty. So what we're interested in is to compute sensitivity kernels that is derivatives of our misfit. And that turns out to be uh, apparently non-trivial, but then in the end, fortunately, very easy. Now, I want to illustrate this with a simple two-dimensional setup. So we, we look at the source receiver geometry here to the left. All the yellow stars are sources. All the red triangles are receivers. And then we have an input model that you see to the right. So this is uh, the shear modulus distributed through this two-dimensional domain. And this is what we want to recover, starting from a homogeneous model. Now, what we do uh, when we want to compute sensitivity kernels, we start with a forward wave field that radiates outwards from the source towards the receivers. And this is what this looks like for a regular mesh. And then at all the receivers, we feed in the adjoint sources that radiate the residuals backwards in time into the medium. This is a snapshot of this adjoint wave field. 
And then the product of the forward and the add-on wave field integrated over time produces the sensitivity kernel that we see down here. And the sensitivity kernel tells us how to modify the current model, such as to reduce the misfit. So this is for the regular mesh. But for a wave field adapted mesh, this apparently is a little bit more difficult. So we still have a source here in the center and the mesh follows the geometry of this wave field. But then the uh, adjoint wave field looks pretty, looks pretty weird. And, uh, and that is because at all of the locations of the adjoint sources, so that is at all of the locations of the, uh, of the receivers, this wave field is way too sparse. Uh, the, the, the grid, the, the mesh is way too sparse. And so here we have a refinement around the actual physical source, but in the locations of the, of the adjoint sources, which are all over the medium, the, wave, the, the grid is very sparse in azimuthal direction and therefore cannot accurately represent that, that physical source. But it, this is actually not a physical source, it's just an adjoint source. So from this figure, one might get the impression that the adjoint source, that the adjoint field is wrong and therefore most likely produces an incorrect sensitivity curve. But then if we just compute that sensitivity kernel, we see that it looks very similar to the sensitivity kernel that we have seen below, even though the adjoint wave field looks wrong. So, so what's going on? How, how can this be? The, the solution is very simple. Um, if we look at the forward problem already in discretized form, then we, we have a, an operator L, this is just a matrix that is acting on a discrete forward wave field U. And this is equal to a discrete forward source F. So L U equals F. And then we apply the discrete adjoint method. So we take this discrete forward problem and we see what does the discrete adjoint problem look like. And it, it looks like this. It's very simple. It's the, simply the discrete adjoint. So it is the Hermitian transpose of L. This is the, the discrete adjoint operator. This acts on the discrete adjoint wave field. And on the right-hand side, we have the discrete adjoint source. So we can simply solve this problem, which we have done here before. It doesn't want to go back. This is what we have done here. This is the solution of the discrete adjoint problem. And this, by construction, produces the correct sensitivity kernel. So this discrete adjoint field here, when plotted, may look a little bit strange, but it really just does not matter. Because this adjoint wave field is not a physical quantity that needs to look nice and needs to look like a physical wave field. It just doesn't matter, right? It just has to be the correct solution of this discrete adjoint equation. And so it is the correct adjoint wave field, even though visually we don't like it. And, uh, and that produces the correct sensitivity curve. And this is essentially why the method works. So, so with this, we can solve a 2D full waveform inversion problem using the toy setup that you have seen before. So just to remind you of the source receiver geometry and of the input model, and then using the regular spectral element mesh that you see up here, we recover the model that you see to the lower left. And using those wave field adapted meshes, we recover the model that you see to the lower right. And, uh, and obviously, they're very, very similar to each other. And here, the beauty is that uh, for the regular mesh, because it has so many elements, we needed 66.6 .6 CPU hours to solve this problem. Solving here meaning to find a model that leads to a misfit reduction of more than 95%. But if we use those wave field adapted meshes, we achieve a 95% mis 95 misfit reduction using only 6.2 CPU hours. So this means that by using this more clever algorithm with the wave field adapted meshes, we have reduced computational cost by more than one order of magnitude, which of course is, is, is very, very significant. It makes the difference between being able or not being able to solve a certain problem. 
Now, the, the application of this to an actual global scale full waveform inversion is, is a work in progress. I still want to show you what we have at the moment. Our main goal here at the moment is to construct a long period reference model of the Earth that includes data from all earthquakes for which we have reliable CMT solutions. That is with a magnitude of more than 5.5. And, uh, and we want this to properly account for wave propagation through 3D heterogeneous media, for topography, oceans, crustal variations, but also finite frequency sensitivity. Now, the setup is as follows. We have a preliminary data set, it's 1,200 earthquakes, and it's continuously expanding. We have about 3,000 to 4,000 recordings, broadband recordings per earthquake with a minimum period of 80 seconds. Meanwhile, we actually took to 60 seconds and we use complete waveforms. So that is really three components and all the body and surface waves. And, uh, and the, the initial model is PREM and we use again an LBFGS method to solve this optimization problem. These are some preliminary results. What you see is as h velocity and as v velocity as a function of depth. So the propagation speeds of horizontally polarized S waves and vertically polarized S waves uh, on top at a depth of 150 kilometers, 1000 kilometers, 2500 kilometers. So it's a whole earth model, which contains a lot of detail. I don't really want to go into the interpretation here. It looks very similar to, to models that have been produced before using much more data and, uh, and much larger computational cost. And the computational cost is actually my main message here. This is what I want to, what, what I want to show. If we had solved this problem, so if we had tried to compute this whole earth model using traditional finite element measures that I have shown before, we would have required about 1.3, 1.4 million GPU hours on our national supercomputer. Uh, some, some colleagues um, in Princeton, now in Colorado in 2016, they uh, computed a global full waveform inversion model that has slightly lower resolution, and that required 320,000 GPU hours. Of course, to some extent, this is a comparison of apples and oranges, but still what is important here is the order of magnitude. And, uh, and then other colleagues um, in Princeton in 2002 computed a global full waveform inversion model with a similar resolution, and they actually used 1.1 million GPU hours on their supercomputer. Now, for the model that you have seen, we used about 15,000 GPU hours. So there are two orders of magnitude in computational cost between the traditional uh, methods that you see up here and the full waveform inversion with the wave field adaptive meshes that, uh, that we have developed and, and are currently used. So some conclusions here. Um, we have seen that those wave field adaptive meshes, they, they are designed in order to be in accord with prior knowledge of the wave field geometry. And the mesh complexity, so the number of azimuthal elements can be adapted to the complexity of the medium. If your medium is very smooth, you may get away with a very small number of azimuthal elements. If your medium is very complicated and produces a lot of scattering, then the number of azimuthal elements, of course, needs to be increased. Uh, it works very well for smooth, that is, tomographic models. And this is what we have typically at global scale. And as we have seen, it can be incorporated into full waveform inversion schemes. Of course, there is, uh, uh, there is more bookkeeping to be done because you need a different mesh for all of the, uh, for all of the sources. And, uh, and effectively, I think it's fair to say that we reduce the dimensionality of the problem by around one. So effectively, we, we reduce a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. And as a consequence, the computational cost is a lot lower. And we have seen this preliminary global scale application. We are going towards long period 3D reference models that honor wave propagation through 3D heterogeneous media, but also topography, oceans, crustal variations, and so on and so forth. And our, our long-term ambitious goal is to, to come up with such a reference model that includes all earthquakes with magnitude above 5.5. So, so far using 1,200 events, the, 
The results, I think, are very encouraging. The, the model geologically makes a lot of sense. It compares well to other models, but the computation requirements are one to two orders of magnitude lower compared to similar studies that have been done in the past. Now, this brings me to the end. Uh, the last few slides I want to show contain, contain some literature that, that goes into more detail. As I said at the beginning, this presentation, this lecture was really to whetten your appetite for, for more detail. And those details can be found in the, uh, in the papers that are listed here. But uh, what I really would like to bring to your attention is, uh, uh, is a, more extensive, um, uh, a more extensive book. In fact, it's called Lecture Notes on Inverse Theory. We uploaded this a few, uh, a few months ago to the um, uh, preprint server of Cambridge University Press. It's called Cambridge Open Engage. And, uh, and when you go to the website, you, you can see the a snapshot of the website here to the right. You can, you can find this book, which contains really all the basics of, of geophysical inverse theory, including some of the, uh, of the content that I have just shown. And it's complemented by, uh, by lots of uh, interactive code examples that you can run and, and where you can learn more. So really just, just Google Cambridge Open Engage go to the, the earth science part of it, and then you will find those, those lecture notes to, to play with. Uh, then we also have some other resources, for example, a YouTube channel, where you can see some of the content that I have shown explained in, in, in little uh, video abstracts, but also we have a software library in our group. So if you go to www.swp.ethz.ch, you will find uh, software, um, and much of the software is actually educational and covers some of the content that I have shown here. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for, for your attention, and uh, I would be happy to, this, to discuss more. Thanks a lot.